my presentation gonna be like less uh, technical, not things that how I approach things. It's gonna be like more for people who are. Um, by the way, do we have a people who are learning web automation right now? Maybe like kind of like a junior level, or okay, perfect. Uh, That's gonna be more for you guys. And here I'm gonna talk about the locator strategies in um, and compare CSS versus expert. Okay, so before I'll jump to that, let me uh, quickly introduce myself. Uh, as Evgeny mentioned, I am a lead as that engineer in Drive Market, and uh, I'm mostly working with mobile automation, uh, with like IPOM, uh, XYTS, Android, uh, you know. Uh, kind of mobile is like my, my passion. Uh, I love mobile, I like, like everything that's come with mobile, like deep links, push notifications, all of the stuff. And that's why I was like more interested to solve that presentation, how they come up with this thing. But uh, yeah, as I mentioned today, I'm gonna talk about the more web stuff. Okay, uh, so this is a list of company where I work for. Um, as I mentioned, I currently work in the market, and let's jump to the. Um, okay, so what is the problem, and what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Um, why, like, especially for you guys, if you just started to learn web automation, uh, why is it hard for you to locate elements, right? Because in a theory, uh, if you will like search how to locate elements, it's gonna be easy, right? You're like trying to find by ID or like something unique. But the thing is, not um, not all web developers are trying to follow the convention of uh, unique elements, and also um, that come with like some developers don't assign any identifications, and you don't, you can't really. Sometimes you can't really find exact. Um, unique identification for specific elements that you're looking for. And um, if you guys uh, ever had experience testing uh, React applications, like Web React applications or Angular applications, uh, you probably already experienced when some of the elements, uh, some of the classes for these elements, they are like generated on the fly pretty much. And if you like it, if you like this element, uh, it's going to be changed like the next day because selector is going to be regenerated. And um, this is like common thing nowadays. And uh, CSS and XP applicators are like providing you uh, a lot of ways to solve it. So let's start, um, let's start with a simple thing. So uh, I will start with CSS because CSS is more like popular and it's more simple and many companies that I work for they used uh, CSS locators uh, only. So um, your first thing that you can come up with, uh, try to find like, um, of course you will need to know to have some kind of like a basic HTML knowledge for that. Uh, otherwise, like, I mean, I don't know, maybe it will make no sense for you. Um, so first of all, try to find elements using uh, class name. Uh, for this case, CSS provides actually a shortcut. Uh, if you can see here, uh, you can just put uh, dot, and this is pretty much shortcut for CSS identifying this is a class name. And uh, here's actually a little uh, thing. Uh, if you have this like class name, right, and if you have like a space uh, between this class name, uh, you will need to replace it with dot, like otherwise it's not gonna uh, really work. Okay. Uh, so the second thing is it's. Uh, um, if you see that your element has ID, which is an identification value, right? Um, according to uh, W3C, how many of you heard about the W3C standards? Okay, one, two, okay. Wow, oh, plenty of you. So according to, so ba basically, um, 3WC, it's a standard how pretty much all web applications should look like. And uh, in this standard, it says, uh, in the single page, there should be only one element with unique identification. If you have like uh, two elements with the same IDs, uh, as a test, as a testers, you can like report an issue because, like, I mean, it's against the convention and it should not be, it should not be there. Uh, I mean, check it anyway. But uh, if you see the ID, you should be like confident this element is um, unique, and you're not gonna have the same ID on the same page. So again, in CSS, uh, there's a shortcut for it, and it's just a pound sign. And using the pound sign, you can like locate uh, ID for it. All right, let's go next. Uh, sometimes everything else is good, and um, you don't have like any uh, unique class name, or you don't have like any ID. In this case, um, 
you can try to allocate elements using the attributes, right? So, um, do you guys know what's the attributes in the CSS tree? Okay. Um, so just uh, just in case if someone doesn't know, like uh, the first thing here, if or button, it's like element, right? And this is like type, role, or like something else. It's pretty much the attributes. And if you are defining the attributes, because there's a lot of different attributes, and for CSS there's like no shortcuts for them, and you need to define the full locator using the square brackets. And uh, this is like simple examples, like how can you do that? Just putting square brackets, defining the um, attribute and uh, equal to attribute value. And that's pretty much how can you um, locate it. And uh, if you are, if it's even like more complicated, and let's say, uh, if we will take a look to this locator, right, div class, and this is a perfect example when some class names, they are like dynamic to generate, right? So we can assume, okay, probably W's input is kind of probably static, but this comes with this like, you know, random uh, characters, they are probably uh, regenerate, and uh, that's probably a React application because they doing it a lot. And uh, in this case, you can just use uh, attribute, but you can use a partial match. Let's say you want to just a partial match, that's like some words should uh, be here. You can just use this syntax to locate element just using partial match. All right, uh, here's a lot of things that you can do with CSS, actually. Um, I know it's pretty simple, uh, but you can do, uh, in case if you will need like some advanced things, you can go to this uh, W3School uh, link, and uh, you can see this like table, and you can like explore more ways in action, how can you do with CSS. All right, and now um, let's go to the CSS in XPath comparison. Um, so um, probably most of you know that uh, Selenium WebDriver that it supports uh, CSS and XPath. And uh, it's kind of like um, considered as a best practice if, if in your framework you're sticking to CSS or XPath. Like in most cases it's gonna be CSS because you won't have this confusion of locators. Because again, pretty much um, they are doing uh, the same thing. And um, here was the rumors, I mean not rumors, like it was back in the days actually an issue that XPath was really, really much slower than CSS. And this is the graphs, but as you can see, it was tested in Chrome 32, and now we have Chrome 76, so it's like, this like uh, really outdated data, and right now they are performing pretty much in the same speed, and it doesn't really matter from the performance perspective which one you are gonna use. Okay, uh, let's quickly talk about some benefits of XPath. Uh, XPath itself is more um, complicated. It doesn't look that nice as CSS, but at the same time, it it's provides you a lot of um, way. Uh, how can you like, how can you do like as uh, your locator thing? So first of all, let's um, talk about the searching by text, right? Using CSS, you cannot find element using a uh, text, there's just no way to do that. And in this case, uh, you can use like contains text uh, function in CSS and find um, element by text. But is there a good thing to locate elements by text or not? It's like a different discussion. I'm just saying like, you can do that if you really want in the XPath. Okay, and uh, you can also do some uh, expressions here. You can like find, okay, I want this class as it having this attribute, or it should be like uh, different. Uh, or you can say it should have like this class, and also it should have this attribute. So you kind of like, pretty much you write in like simple function, right, inside your locator. And um, this is like power of um, XPath, basically. And uh, more than that, you can also um, write really, really complicated things. Uh, if you look to this, like down here, uh, you can see like this one is like really um, heavily filled with all of these like functions and contains functions and um, class names. And I mean, again, uh, XPath just allows you to like write some crazy stuff if you really want to do that. Uh, Okay, and uh, again, there's like many ways to interact with uh, uh, elements using XPath, and you can like 
go to this Guru 99, it's a great resource, by the way, if you like learning Selenium, I would suggest you check it out. Uh, so here you can like see what uh, you can do pretty much with XPath and to see like the full list of what it's uh, capable to do. Okay, and uh, so uh, here is a more thing that you can also come up with. Uh, let's say if you don't want to store your locator as a constant, uh, you can like create a function and like let's say in this example get element and just to pass uh, labels inside of this locator and it's gonna return you it's pretty much dynamically gonna accept like a label and type in this case and gonna return you the full uh, string that you like requested. Um, why do we need to do that? So pretty much we're trying to like not uh, repeat ourselves and creating more uh, dynamic methods that we're gonna that's gonna be like more reusable. Um, so this is like pretty much um, um, things that you need to try to do in your testing framework. So first of all, uh, develop robust locators. Uh, ideally, in your company, you should have a process with your front-end developers, and um, they should they should help you. They should help you to uh, generate unique locators. And it's not going to be it's not it should be like a, in the process. Like you should uh, ask your manager to talk to the front-end manager and to set it as a, as a process. And it's not going to be like hey, like can you like me something because for them it's really not a big deal but it's gonna help you a lot later on uh, don't repeat your code um, have accurate reliable reporting um, maybe it's not even for you it's gonna be more for your colleagues or for business people who wants to see the reporting uh, think about parallel execution because uh, you we don't want to run our test really uh, long we're trying to start uh, like cut execution time and the parallel execution gonna be um, really good solution for that. Uh, handle flaky tests, uh, well, if your test is like really, um, like if it's flaky, right, if you are, you can control of execution of that, sometimes it's better just comment this out or uh, disable it, rather than just have like a flaky test uh, on your reports. And uh, test early and test often. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, I know it was quick short and uh, like probably like all of you already know this stuff so again as I mentioned it was like more for beginners any questions okay um. oh, guys, I have a question <laughs> that was my question <laughs> um, so I know you mentioned talking about um, working directly with the front-end team mm -hmm. um, to at uh, unique locators. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered uh, actually having a custom attribute specifically for QA? Um, yeah, we do actually. We do. Uh, it's like part of their code review and it's part of the process. As I mentioned, you should like define it with like managers. It should be like a standard. Uh, like ideally, code review should not pass if they don't have like a test ID locators. 